So yeah, so what I want to talk to you about today is a project that we've been running at Stanford for the last couple of years that's actually fairly recently gotten deployed in a couple of different places, uh, both on the social impact side, uh, which I'll share some of those stories, and industrially as well. Uh, and it's really part of this movement about how I see software engineering and sort of data as really changing the way people are building applications. And it has this kind of obnoxious name, uh, Software 2.0, uh, which uh, we decided to start using. But I'll, I'll explain to you why I like that name, okay? So when you think about machine learning, you probably think about really high-end applications. You think about things like translation, uh, medical imaging, and robotics, all being compiled down to these you know, next generation deep learning architectures. And indeed, like, that's really cool. That's happening in these kind of piecemeal applications in a bunch of different ways. But if you look at why deep learning is, is really popular and what's happening, it's not just about the quality. In fact, in a lot of applications, you can build higher quality systems without using uh, even some of the modern deep learning infrastructure. But to me, it's really about software engineering. So there's this great article from Google uh, a while back that they had this translation system that was built with this kind of brittle C++ code, hundreds of thousands of lines of code. And they replaced it with 500 lines of code of one of these machine learning frameworks, the TensorFlow framework, that allowed them to get state-of-the-art quality. And that compression in lines of code really is not unique just to translation problems, but you're seeing it applied in all kinds of different areas, ETL and data cleaning, how you tune your database system, and even things inside the network. And my point is, in all these places, you're starting to see that people are starting to use ML to replace the heuristics that are inside their system. And the reason they're doing it is, it's just dramatically less code. So this irritating name, Software 2.0, is about replacing all those different swaths of code, and we don't know the limit of what's going to actually be eaten uh, by these machine-learned pieces. Okay. So what is Snorkel all about? Well, to a first approximation, what does a machine learning application actually look like in brass tacks? It has three pieces. It has a model, it has some training data, and there's some hardware. Now, over the last couple of years, the model has basically become a commodity. You want to install the latest and greatest natural language processing model, you can literally pip, pip install it. And down it comes, you get BERT, and you start running and using it. A couple weeks later, something else comes out that's great. GPT-2, which was the AI, open AI model that was too dangerous to release, well, someone released it. And in fact, you can pip install that too. Okay. Hardware, well, if you need some hardware, you need some GPU, you can go out to AWS, get some EC2 instances. You need eight GPUs, you've got eight, eight GPUs. So in a way that wasn't even imaginable four or five years ago for people who were building these machine learning systems like we were building, the components, the raw ingredients, are just accessible to more people and more enterprises. But there's still a problem. And the problem is that training data has not become a commodity. For your application, you ha still have to provide the training data. The models, they're basically stock. The hardware, they're basically stock. Everyone's doing approximately the same thing. But the interesting piece is how you train and build those models. So we took this bet, and a great student named Alex Ratner was the one who led this, this project three years ago. And we said, you know what? The world's going to become kind of commodity models. And if you were paying attention to machine learning two or three years ago, you would wake up every day, you would go to archive, and someone was doing some new task with some new tweak of some new architecture. And then all of a sudden, it kind of went radio silent. People weren't building these new models and improving on the state of the art. They were starting to combine and compose them. So we started thinking about this. Being academics, you have to kind of look at the future and, and, and hope and pray. And we hoped and prayed, and we called this thing data programming. And what we realized is that engineers, where they were going to increasingly spend their time in industry and in these applications, was shaping the training data. They were going to create these training sets. Now, if you take a machine learning class, I taught the intro machine learning class yesterday, we tell them that training data shows up, X and Y pairs, drop from the sky from God herself, and then we start machine learning. But anyone who's ever built one of these applications can tell you those X and Y pairs came out of a really complicated data pipeline and data process. And they were assembled together, and they had bias, and they had correlation, and they had all kinds of stuff before you actually built this, this system. So we asked a very basic question three years ago. Why isn't there any mathematical or system structure that allows us to build these pipelines faster, using different, differing quality data, to be able to build and bring these things to bear as quickly as possible? So the key idea behind this project was that training data is going to be the critical infrastructure for all of what's happening in these software 2.0 stacks. And what we want to do is start to create the first generation of programming language and kind of data abstractions that allow us to build these applications more efficiently. And the way to evaluate this work isn't to say, you know, is this the absolute best in how to build these applications? It's really 
not how well the bear is dancing, it's that the bear is dancing, okay? All right, so when we first started doing this, we thought that really what this was was an a way to try and make machine learning accessible to more people. That was what was driving a lot of our effort. But what we realized actually very quickly is that asymptote that I was telling you about in models, it's real. And it turns out that if you look at the most recent state of the arts on ImageNet, both of them that have been in the last, you know, in the last couple years have actually appealed to using more and different types of data. One was this auto augment, which used learned data augmentations, which was following up on some of our work, which basically takes the data pipeline and sort of makes the observation that if I have a picture of a cat and I rotate it two degrees, still a picture of a cat. And so that allows you to build much more large, robust models. Facebook released something that was awesome, which was using weekly supervised pre-training. But the point is, both of them were basically taking other data sources and other ways of feeding in sort of lower quality training data to improve the state of the art. So it's not just about accessibility and democratizing these things, it's actually about improving quality too. Okay. So I was asked to talk a little bit about some of the applications that motivated us. And one of the applications which I'm still monstrously proud of was conducted with one of my really good friends, uh, which was fighting human trafficking. So there's Mike Caffarella, uh, he's at Michigan. A couple years ago, uh, we're still running this project to this day, uh, which is really exciting. But a couple years ago, DARPA came to us and they asked us to look at the problem of human trafficking. And the problem that they were interested in, in particular, as part of this much larger effort, was basically fo folks are forced into, you know, who are trafficked, are forced into work labor, but also sexual services as well. And the idea was that we could basically read online ads about, for sexual services and identify potential victims of human trafficking. The problem is law enforcement can't possibly search through all the online ads that are out there. And it turns out, as I'll show you later, even if they're reading the ads, it's very difficult for them to tell who's a legitimate provider, that is someone who's not trafficked and is participating in this market, versus someone who's part of a trafficking ring. And so we've been working on this now for five years, I think, at this point. But what's amazing is we've actually built a machine reading system and several generations of it that allows you to read over these advertisements and basically builds, my mother's very proud of this, the world's best prostitution pricing model by extracting all the information that's in this text to try and predict whether or not someone's pricing under the market or engaging in riskier services. And this is actually in front of real law enforcement people. It's actually generated arrests. And it's one of been one of the most satisfying things I've ever done in my career with one of the nicest human beings I know, Mike Caffarella. Okay. Now, as I mentioned, this thing has already read. This is a very stale number, 100 million ads with human caliber quality. The person who leads it, who led the project is this guy right here. That's John Kerry in the background. That's Chris White. Uh, and he won this you know, medal, which we're still really excited about. And since 2016, when he won this medal, we've still maintained, and actually, you know, Teradata in part has funded a lot of the operation that's gone on here. Uh, and we are still actively producing extractions and putting them from the law enforcement officers in front of the DOJ with this stuff. Now, I'm gonna come back to this at the end because this new system, Snorkel, is actually powering a lot of what's going on under the covers. And this is the thing that we've been absolutely most excited about. Now, the folks who were involved, there's actually a much longer list, but these are sort of the key folks. Stephen Box now at Brown, Alex Ratner was leading the project, uh, and Braden graduated this morning. I was at his defense just a couple hours ago. Okay. So this has been done also, I should say, with a great use of users and sponsors. Uh, this is a little bit of an outdated slide. There are a bunch of folks. Uh, Google very nicely put out a big blog post about how they were using Snorkel, uh, what they were using it for. A bunch of recent papers from various different labs and various different production teams uh, of actually producing in this data. And we've learned a huge amount from those folks who have been using this system in production capabilities, okay? which is really, really cool that, that these folks are using it. I'm gonna talk mostly about text data today, but we've been doing increasingly where we've been excited are things about image and video and time series. Please don't hesitate to reach out to me if you have an application that you think would be interesting on this. Uh, and there are increasingly tutorials written by us and other people about these different data types. Okay. So let me tell you the core simple idea that's underneath data programming and this, these labeling functions. And hopefully you can see why this would be a powerful kind of metaphor to build training sets efficiently. Okay. So, our observation was that when people were building those pipelines, those training data pipelines, they were basically combining a handful of different signals in kind of ad hoc ways. They were doing pattern matching to create training sets. They were doing some amount of what's called distant supervision, looking things up in a knowledge base and kind of trying to apply it. Uh, they were trying little heuristic programs that they were running. Some people were doing more sophisticated things like using topic models or third party models that were already laying around their enterprise, uh, doing different things around crowdsourcing. And our observation was that basically when people were building these models circa four or five years ago, including us, 
They were basically taking one source and not taking all available, all the available supervision into account. And they would be kind of in this isolated and kind of ad hoc way. So at Snorkel, what we tried to do is just formalize this sort of programmatic source of labeling. We needed an abstraction that allowed us to take all the supervision that was out there and put it in one giant place and replace this ad hoc weak supervision with a formal kind of theoretically grounded thing. Now, in my weaker moments, I admit to being a theoretician. I was raised by a theoretician. I still value doing theory. I won't bore you with any theory here. But we've basically written a ton of theoretical papers that describe under what conditions you can recover both the bias and the correlations of these sources. And that's powered a lot of the engine. Now, I won't bore you with that, but I will give you enough of a formal setup to understand what's going on. So the idea, the abstraction is super simple, super dumb. Data point comes in, it passes through a function, and all the function does, let's say it's classification, is output, say yes, no, or it can abstain. And that abstention is actually critical. The source has to be able to say, I don't know, for both foundational kind of mathematical reasons and systems reasons. And this function here, we just call a labeling function, okay? Just a map, right? Lots of stuff can be put in this map, and lots of stuff has been put in this map. Domain heuristics, supervision, pattern matching, other classifiers, crowdsourcing, yada, yada, yada. It's deceptively powerful what's gone on there. So let me show you why just knowing the source of every training point allows us to do some pretty non-trivial inferences. And this is basically what I spent the last couple of years doing. So let's imagine a person here who's writing some of these distance supervision kinds of rules. What they do is they've written a couple of high accuracy rules. So these two rules are 90% and 85% accurate. And for illustration, they've labeled some fraction of points, 10,000 points at 90% accuracy, let's say. They realize that their model doesn't have great recall. So what do they do? They add another rule, and they label a million points at 60% accuracy. But now kind of immediately they have a problem. If they just take all of this data and pool it together, it looks like a gigantic set of not very accurate data. And if you put that into a model, it will actually its quality will go down. And this is actually one of the real examples in deep dive that would really frustrate our users. We would give it to them, which was our old system, they would add in something about it. They would think, I'm giving it more information, and the quality would get dramatically worse. Okay? So what's the fix here? Well, anyone who's looking at this can tell you just have to keep track of the good points and the bad points, and you should be able to do a better job. And indeed, mathematically, that's true. Now, what we're interested in is trying to estimate the accuracy and the correlations among these sources, but we want one extra twist. And the extra twist is a little bit for art, but it's also important to push the state of the art with this which is we wanted to estimate these accuracies without any labels whatsoever. So for us, those accuracies are unknown, and so are the correlations. And the entire theory tells us under what situations we can recover those accuracies and the extent to which all of these sources are correlated. And it turns out after hammering on this for a couple of years, you can do this in some pretty remarkable situations. And that's what we built the programming language instructions on. Okay. So how is this used? Okay. So First thing, the programming model is users write these labeling functions, and those generate a bunch of noisy labels. They pass then to this thing that we call a label model, which I won't bore you with in, in too much detail, but it basically estimates the accuracies and correlations as a formal way of saying how accurate each source is. And then weirdly, what we're going to do is we're going to estimate for every training point, given all the information we know about it, how accurate is that point. And let me show you how we do that. Okay, so the, you, have, you can imagine a matrix here where I have data and I have labeling functions. Blue is positive, red is negative, and white is abstain. And my goal is to guess for each one of these data points what its true label should be. And I'm going to let myself get a distribution over those labels. Now when we look at those, there's some obvious challenges that you have to overcome. These two labeling functions look really highly correlated. They're probably not independent. We don't want to overcount them. And we need a statistical test that can tell we shouldn't count labeling function one and two the same that we count three. They're really, really highly correlated. This one conflicts with everything. If we believe our, other our labeling functions are high accuracy, then this thing has low accuracy, that 60% rule, and we should discount it. And this one has very low coverage, but it may be very high accuracy. And so the goal is we have to take in all of this information to be able to guess what are in those probabilistic labels. And that's what our theory is about. Okay. Now, the theory is not too hard at some level. There's a lot of math and matrices and other stuff, but the core idea is really simple. If everybody else says no and you say yes, you're probably wrong. We just apply this a billion times, do some fancy matrix calculus, and back out what the optimal estimate is of how accurate each one of the labelers are. Importantly, we see for every point 
what the labeler has said on every other point. That's why it's so critical that we have this labeling function, that we see what the source is saying so we can assign an accuracy. Once we do that, we get out the probabilistic training data and we feed it to a big end model. Now, there are a bunch of systems reasons that you want to do this, but let me explain to you from a modeling perspective why the split between this probabilistic training data and end model makes a lot of sense. Okay. All right. So if you imagine the label model, what it's going to do is it's going to label some points, but it's going to abstain on a whole bunch of others. And that's just the way people program. If we use this big, deep model under the covers, it can automatically take all of its knowledge about sort of synonyms of words and you know, related edge detectors of its vision and generalize these classes to much more robust sets. And so this is generalization. And you can prove mathematically that actually it's possible to have these point process generalize into this nice way. And there's a series of experimental papers that show you get a huge boost in recall that has more answers without a huge loss in precision. Okay? So this is why we have the split. This is an example of what I just said. The labeling function may mention things like treats, causes, induces, and prevents when looking for diseases. But it will also, because we have these like, sort of big language models, be able to pull out things like could produce or support a diagnosis of automatically. And that's something that the, in the previous generation of systems, basically the engineer had to do. But now the machine learning, they're leaning on the machine learning to do it. A second thing which is exciting is if you plot here, this is in log scale, the x-axis of data points, and this is the accuracy, and the scale is a little bit strange. But if you look at this thing, what's happening here is, is we're feeding in more unlabeled data. Because our supervision is now code, not data, we can apply it to new points. We don't need a manual, tedious effort to get every x that comes in. You can feed in unlabeled data and actually get higher quality. And that's something that's really exciting because it means you can take these points and transfer them, these functions, and transfer them to a whole host of different domains. And the last one is the one that's most industrially important, uh, but also important in the medical school. What we do is this thing we call cross-modal supervision. So you want to look at an x-ray and say whether it's abnormal or not, just to simplify. That's an image classification task. It's a really painful task to get labels for because you have to pay a radiologist to do it. However, you can look at the reports that you have about that patient and start to, dis and to, start to be able to label those, those images without asking the radiologist. Sort of, oh, I saw a pneumothorax in this thing, or they had chest pain, and I can label this thing as abnormal just from looking at this, from this text. The problem is I don't have the text, the report, at test time because the patient walked into the office and I took a picture of their chest. No one's written the report yet for me to do a classification. So by having this split between what we call servable and non-servable features, I can train with a bunch of information and then at test time get a better model that I'll use. And this is something that a lot of our industrial partners really like because they have these huge slow models that they want to use for offline training, but then online they want to use something that's really small and fast to meet whatever their requirements are. Okay. And you can see some cool stats here. This is a classifier that was built in hours on a weekend that matched what they did in eight person months. To be clear, that was like we matched the, the line. We took a line. They spent more than eight person months labeling this. And so there's a whole paper, which is at one of the nerd tabloids, that explains exactly how well the, the uh, hand labelers did against these weak labelers. Okay. So just to summarize why we're so excited about this stuff, manual labels are slow. The nth data point takes as much as the first data point, roughly speaking. They're expensive. Even inexpensive labelers cost $10 an hour. Radiologists cost hundreds of dollars per hour, at least. And they're static. And this is the one that, if you really work on these problems, is the thing that, that kind of eats at you the most. You spend all this money and time to collect your data set about positive and negative. And someone says, you know what? I really wanted neutral, too. Oh, dear God. You've got to go back and relabel everything and identify it. If your supervision is static and classical, you can't do this. If your supervision is embodied in functions, it's much easier to iterate on that specification. And most machine learning projects fail because of specification mismatch, not actually because of these kind of training data issues. Programmatic labels, well, there's a cost to write the programs, and we've been trying to move this line to the left for the last couple of years. But once you get it, super cheap. This is dimes. That's huge stacks of cash, so that seems like a win. And this thing is dynamic, OK? you can take it and run it in a bunch of different ways. And I'm being a little bit glib here because there are a bunch of challenges that are introduced by these approaches. But this is why we're at least excited when I talked about it's not how well the bear is dancing, it's that the bear is dancing, that you can get some of these benefits in real applications. And I invite you to check the blog to understand it. 
I will not bore you with theoretical results, but there are there. The message is that there, this data you could worry is a lot worse than supervised data. It is not. The information theory optimal matches for both uh, under some very nice conditions, and we've been hammering that out. This is the same rate you would expect in a supervised case. All this stuff is available and exciting. Okay. All right, so please send feedback. There's open source. People check things in. It's, it's very exciting. Now, the last thing I want to talk about is a late-breaking trend, uh, which is this thing about massive multitask learning, which Alex, Braden, Fred, and Jared wrote a very nice paper about. I'm always suspicious when my students are like, oh, we should hold this paper. I'm like, well, where are you going to submit it next? And I said, oh, AAAI. I was like, that's interesting. You guys don't normally submit to AAAI. Why, why are you doing that? Well, it turned out it was in Hawaii. So my whole lab went to Hawaii. I'm not going to say that that's why they submitted the paper there, but it wasn't lost on me that there were lots of pictures of them in shorts. Okay? Anyway, and a bunch of them went, not just these four characters. So what is multitask learning? It's a super old idea. Uh, basically, it dates back to, uh, you know, before Caruana's thesis, but he was the one who really nailed it down in a, in a way that I think was really nice. You're going to have a bunch of tasks, and they're going to share parameters across those tasks. And this is a really interesting idea because if you learn something about parsing a sentence, Maybe you learned a little bit about what the intent of that sentence is. If you know the verbs in the sentence, maybe you would do a better job understanding which entities are present, you know, the people, places, and things. And so they should share information. This is caught on again. You've probably heard of things called BERT if you're in this area, which are these big uh, transformer-based models that actually allow you to put task heads on top. Okay? So we were working on these what we call massive multitask things for, for a while now. And what you have is you have primary tasks and you have related tasks, but you also have a bunch of auxiliary tasks that are sharing this core of parameters. So you do part of speech and entities, queries, personal query, sensitive topics, all kinds of things. And the idea is super simple. Capitalize on supervision at every level of granularity. Okay. Now, what was awesome about this is that my interface to students is to like buy them burritos. So I trade burritos for code, I trade burritos for results. In one of the results, there's this benchmark that people run for massive multitask learning that a lot of the companies have actually been really excited about called Glue. And so I traded burritos for this result. And basically what was really exciting about this, it was pretty funny, uh, this Glue benchmark, uh, we went and competed, you see Alibaba, Microsoft, Google, all competing in this benchmark, which is really cool. All the top five submissions use this multitask learning. And for a brief while on March 21st, for about 10 days, we were number one. Funny little side story, we were number, I think we were tied for number one before I was giving a talk at a retreat, and within the time of my students going to sleep and me getting up to give the keynote in the morning, uh, we got beat by Microsoft, who then put out, a, who put out a great press release and had been doing a bunch of other cool stuff. So this, my point is, is like these systems, these MTL systems, are not a quirk. This seems to be a trend for how people are building the next generation of these machine learning systems, and they're fundamentally different than the old ones. The old ones were always take a single task and beat the crap out of it, isolation modularity. The new generation of systems are do everything at once and share as much as you possibly can. This is an idea that machine learning people have been on for 10 years, but it just started to work. Like we've been trying and trying to do this, but it actually seems to work now. So it's super exciting. And there's a great blog post that just is a brass tacks explanation of how this works that was written by these two jokers. Okay. And there's a bunch of code coming out. I think it's actually already released. So the last thing I wanted to say, so this is a, the, the team that built it. These are the folks that consume the burritos and produce the code. So the last thing that I wanted to say about this is that indeed, this is actually going back to this human trafficking in ads with dark data. So Greg D'Angelo leads this effort. He's been doing it. He's the one who deserves, in my mind, the most amount of credit when all the press people left uh, doing you know, human trafficking research and there was no more funding from the government and we all had to scrap and put it together. Greg has been a tireless advocate of working with law enforcement and uh, leaning on our lab. These are all folks from my lab uh, who have worked on this project. This is a very preliminary result that should be taken with a lot of grain of salt. We just had a paper accepted about a related result, but these are some even late-breaking numbers. The basic experiments that we're running are as follows. You show an ad to law enforcement. You say, is there human trafficking in this ad? Their precision is not very good. That is, they say there's human trafficking, there may or may not be. You know, they're looking at 4% precision here in our experiments with real life law enforcement officers. The machine learned model does quite a bit better. Okay? And that's something we're trying to understand, is this really a useful amount better, this predictive thing? But this is, again, one of these multitask models. It's doing the extractions, it's doing the regressions, and it's doing it all put together. And this is really exciting because when you start to build these models that used to take six months and PhDs to build, you didn't have time to make this kind of rapid improvement.
But now, these are open source tools that people can download and run with. And this has been something that's been really, really exciting. And, and Greg has been leading the way uh, at Claremont doing this over the last couple of years, and really asking some deep social science questions. So with that, really what I wanted to conclude is, you know, I started this talk by telling you that, that I was, you know, this really hype, bizarre Silicon Valley software 2.0 nonsense. And I was telling you why I started to believe it. And the reason I started to believe it is every engineer is spending their time in a different way in my lab and in a lot of the folks that we talk to in industry. They're not spending it writing C++ code and optimizing it, at least the folks that we kind of myopically see. The problem is there is no tooling for them. There's no debugger. There's no anything. There's nothing that looks like the conventional programming stack. And so what my lab has been trying to do for the last couple of years is build versions of it. Amazingly, the bar is so astonishingly low that people use graduate student code, like smart people. And that's pretty exciting. And so we're hoping that this makes these AI and machine learning techniques radically easier by focusing on modeling supervision and not worrying so much about models. You see a lot of people worry about models. I think this is a mistake. Models are becoming a commodity. Sure, there are good ones, but the chances that someone who's building an application really wants to spend their time innovating on these models, it's just a small margin. Like, look at all those models on that glue leaderboard. We're all within one point of each other. People hammering for months. And we're basically all using the same architecture at the end. So I think these things are commodity. Also, we don't mind negative feedback. Uh, we're academics. We have thick skins and short memories. So please go ahead, send us a bunch of stuff, especially if you think of work that's related or interesting. Especially one of the best feedbacks that we get is we think when people say, here's a problem that I don't think it works on. That is super exciting to us. Because again, it probably doesn't. You're probably right. But that's super useful feedback for us to build the next generation of these things. So with that, thank you so much for your time and attention. Appreciate it. Thank, thank, thank you very much, Chris. Um, any, que any questions? Got time for a couple questions. Thank you, Ray. Uh, is there some domains where it's difficult to write these weak labeling functions? Yes, there's a the question is, are there a bunch of domains where it's, where it's tough to write these functions? Yeah. Uh, one of the ones, I'll, I'll just show you visually kind of an example yes. of, of one of these places where it's hard. So this is a paper that was, uh, you know, still, um, that's posted publicly. Uh, you can see where it's posted. Um, but basically what we were trying to do is classify video. Video and images are tough to write labeling functions on because you seem to need a library to get started. Like what is the function that maps from raw pixels to a classifier? And if I look at these frames here, what they want to do is if you have a heart that has three valves, that's normal, this tricuspid thing, and a bicuspid thing, they want to have a video that they can watch your blood pump and tell, do you have this abnormality or not? The BAV frames you see at the top, the TAV one's down there. Now, as a person looking at that, you can say, oh, I can imagine the vocabulary, how I would describe this image. Uh, you know, the BAV ones are narrow, the TAV ones are brighter. Like, I can start to imagine some of those things. To be able to get started, when we gave this to, to doctors, they couldn't, they couldn't write anything in terms of the raw pixels. And so the approach that we've been taking is these kind of ideas of building up libraries that are domain specific. Here are things like area, eccentricity, and so on, and actually building these weekly supervised things this way. So I wanted to show the pictures because it's kind of clear that you could in principle apply it in a lot of domains, but the devil's in the details. One that's really challenging to us and my lab is now really excited about are also time series. Time series don't have a great vocabulary to describe them. Text and images are kind of rich and natural. You can, you can express a lot of high-level heuristics. Time series requires a lot of domain knowledge and doesn't have the same breadth of, of descriptions. And that's another one we're working on. So it's a great question. It's exactly the things we watch. But video and images are things that we're really obsessed with. Uh, this is really exciting stuff, but I, I wanted to sort of ask an open-ended question, which is, you know, the advantage of a radiologist is they went to medical school yep. and they survived sort of a human vetting process. Right. And if they turn out to be a charlatan, you know, the thought is with any luck, they'll be discovered. Right. Uh, it seems to me as we all get more into machine learning and we, you know, we sort of delegate this stuff to code snippets that people provide, you know, what is to prevent charlatans from, you know, getting into the system and, and you know, so, you know, sort of the wrong answer becomes the right answer because oh, a thousand awesome. bad snippets agree that it's the right answer, right? How do we, how do we so, deal with this? So if I understand the hypothesis of your question, you may be worried that some people in Silicon Valley 
are not on the up and up when it comes to machine learning. Now, that would have never occurred to me. No, I'm just kidding. Or some <laughs> people, perhaps, no, no. In, in other countries no, no, as it's, we it's, are it's, it's, now learning. No, no, it's a very fair point. Actually, there was a great article, I think it was in the New Yorker a, a while ago, where they were talking about how at Google, uh, they were worried about this apocalypse where there was more spam than there was real content, and that the models would switch polarity and start saying the real stuff was spam and vice versa. Um, you know, it was, I, I, I think we're pretty close to that already. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But maybe it's just an interesting view on the universe. No, it's a very serious issue. Now, when you talk about you know, radiologists, I gave this talk at, the, at one of these NAE events a couple of weeks ago, and um, someone said, you, know, you have this reverence for humans that I think as a radiologist is misplaced. <laughs> and so I, I thought it was an interesting statement. What, what, they were, what they were excited about was that you could consolidate in one single place the decisions that people were making, and you would make systematic errors. And this is something I talked about a bunch in previous work. If the errors are systematic, they have at least a hope of being corrected. There's no way to correct a radiologist who has some mistaken belief about what indicates cancer or not because it's not systematic. Now, ultimately, those folks have a huge amount of training. And so everything that we're doing here is in like, very close collaboration with a bunch of different radiologists and other folks to make sure we're holding our feet to the fire because it's very easy to delude yourself on this. If you look at some of the previous published results, they will have models. There was one I was looking at on Twitter the other day that they were talking about how people were, they said, oh, it's a free diagnostic kit. And it was just horribly wrong, horribly wrong, kind of laughably wrong. And you look at their training set, and it has feet in it when they're supposed to be doing chest x-rays. You know, I don't know what a picture of your foot tells you about pneumonia, but it probably shouldn't be there. And so I think your point of how do we validate and understand how these algorithms perform in the real world is really interesting. And right now, all that knowledge and expertise is locked up in the brains of a, of a field. So trying to figure out how to put that together is a major challenge, and we're nowhere close to yeah, solving it. And, and do, we want a, do we want a world where there are no more radiologists? Yeah, you know, well, uh, I mean, it, it sounds like it's THX 1138 at that point, right? right? Yeah. The, the machine just runs, and you know, how it was built and how it functions was lost. Yeah, you know, right. I think that there's a serious concern even in, ma in microscopic versions. So the first, the meta-level question of society, how do, societally, how do we want to allocate human capital? It turns out that if you look at unread reports inside a hospital, something like 55% of the unread reports are these radiographs. So they're not looking at it now. So it would be great to have a triaging effect to be able to deploy it in some smart cases. But the idea that it then erodes a profession that seems like, to me, my personal view is that's a, a, a field too far to cross. Like, you do still need a bunch of folks who are looking at it. Um, I hope that the incentives are in place that people still want to go into that field, that it's not you know, relegated to some kind of strange interaction. But you see this even in the software engineering side, where people have old systems that they trust, they bring up a machine learning system alongside of it, the, old, the new machine learning system performs really well, and then companies usually make one of two decisions. They say, oh, I think the new machine learning system is great and wonderful, and I'm gonna deprecate the old system and you know, to the dustbin of history with you, which you know, can be good but can be bad in the obvious ways, or they're extremely nervous and they never make the switch and they end up paying twice the cost. And so I think this thing, like as a society, which bin are we gonna be in? Are we gonna pay the twice the cost? That's a sensible strategy when you're dealing with losing all the knowledge of radiology, I think. Um, when you're building a software artifact in real life, I don't know, right? Um, but yes, I think that's a big, big point, and I think people have gotten really carried away with this idea that we're gonna replace radiologists. Uh, I just don't believe it. Um, the radiologists are the ones who are gonna teach us how to use this as a tool and to make meaningful progress. And so, you know, God bless people who have the vision of there's gonna be a machine and it's gonna do everything and it's gonna scan you in a shower every day to make sure that you're, you know, not developing tumors and all the rest. Like, that's a beautiful vision. Um, but we're still pretty far away from that. But wonderful points, very thought-provoking. Long, 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 long way from that. Thank yeah. you very much, Thanks so Chris. Much.